The World Economic Forum in Davos begins today. This is the first in-person event since the pandemic. And we decided to look into this week's schedule in order to see what powerful people are talking to, talking about rather. Now, I should admit to you my bias. I immediately turned my nose up at this notion of powerful, unelected people discussing policy that will affect everyone. So I clicked open this, ske this schedule with disdain, and then I thought to myself, okay, you haven't even read the panels yet. Check yourself, Natalie. You're being really cynical. And then I read over the panels, and I went right back to being cynical. I tried. I promise, for the sake of my journalism degree, I tried. So at least now you know my bias and I will try to present this information to you with that bias check in mind. Now, Davos started as an economic conference in the 70s, but it has morphed into a place for powerful people like Bill Gates to show up and give speeches. Of course, 20 years ago, it was more acceptable for powerful people to act important and powerful, but now that is out of fashion, so these people have to act as though they are there to change the world for the better. This creates this public perception issue of wealthy people making decisions for the powerless. Again, these are not elected officials for the most part. Earlier this year, New York Times correspondent Peter Goodman published the book Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. It's kind of a warning, and it highlights this archetype of Davos Man. It's a term that was coined by Harvard's political scientist Samuel Huntington. It refers to global elites who, quote, have little need for national loyalty, right? View national boundaries as obstacles that thankfully are vanishing, and see national governments as residues from the past whose only useful function is to facilitate the elite's global operations. What do you think of that, Clayton? Mm -hmm. Does that sound That's familiar? Like every story we've talked about right. up till now fits this archetype of the many-headed beast. Well, it also feels like, and we, Philip, we were joking about this maybe a few weeks ago, it's like Star Trek, the idea of like Starfleet. You know, it's like, there's yeah. no like, there's no government at all. Like it's just... You know, there's no there's no currency anymore. It's just everyone working together because now there's aliens out there. Right. Right. And so there's no borders. We don't really care about it. And it's just one world government. And that's it. We're the world. That's it. Right. Yes. So, OK, let's dig into the actual what they're going to do. These people. Right. It, it, in addition to eating chocolate and being in Switzerland. Now, instead of this conference being viewed as a consortium of well-intentioned people, it is now seen as a group of wealthy people trying to mask their profit seeking behind woke intentions. This year's panel is a bullseye example of that. So here's a good example. A panel from today is labeled stakeholder Dial dialogue. Do you see the one called the, yep, FIFA. Okay. Okay. Nope, 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 nope. This one, that one's labeled. That okay. one. Okay, now see where it says at the top here, stakeholder dialogue. I think this is an important distinction. Stakeholder capitalism is the progressive new way to talk about capitalism. It is in the words of Vivek Ramaswamy, the trendy idea that companies should serve not just their shareholders, but also other interests and society at large, as if every business decision can be made for the good of everybody, right? So by that definition, we would not have soda right? We would not have pesticides, but it, it's, it's a, it's an extremely utopic society, but or it was definition, but we're saying that we can have panels that are thus defined, right? It's problematic. So companies don't say anymore that they serve their shareholders because it sounds selfish, but instead they serve stakeholders, all of society, right? The problem with that, as Ramaswamy says, is that the guys with the gold get to make the rules. So it's not just market rules, but it's moral rules too. It's also a ruse when companies start to say that they serve all stakeholders, they are choosing which groups of society at large that they wanna speak for. And we're gonna see this later when we talk about the extreme Western bent of Davos. So let's go back to this FIFA conference here. Can you put that back up on the screens? Yeah, same one. Okay. So a stakeholder dialogue on sports as a unifying force. Okay, how can FIFA World Cup do more to unify the world? Well, for starters, they cannot do this, right? 
Which is FIFA suspends Russia from World Cup. Okay, they threw a country out of their sports competition (laughs) because it invaded another country. Yet invading countries otherwise can still compete, right? Right, we can. The United States States was not thrown out. The United States literally this week just went back to invading Somalia. We still can play. Oh, we can play? Game on. Oh, okay. Okay, Uh, when the United States invaded Iraq, which George W. Bush just admitted to, Right? right? We were able to play and compete in those years. China can still compete despite its persecution of the Uyghurs. But FIFA will lead a stakeholder meeting <laughs> on how to serve, according to the definition of stakeholder capital, other interests and society at large. Not society at large, Western society, right? Right. right. So, how does excluding Russia, but including China and the US, serve society at large exactly? Now, I counted 146 panels labeled stakeholder stakeholder dialogue, which again is code for we're looking out for everybody, uh, you know, not just our bottom line. But are they? A report published today by Oxfam found that 573 new people became billionaires during the pandemic, while 263 million people fell into extreme poverty. The beneficiaries of all of these millions were people who worked in food and energy businesses. So those people will show up in one of the most expensive countries in the world, Switzerland, to discuss how to address global issues such as climate change, right? Yet they all support NATO's war with Russia which exacerbates climate change by, oh, you know, shipping heavy weapons across the globe, leaving military equipment to decay in the earth and leave gasoline and other chemicals into runoff soil. Uh, Maybe war isn't good for the earth and it should fall off the agenda totally if panels like this are to be taken seriously. Russia, what's next? Uh, No, not just that one. The one called eco-anxiety. Oh, here, eco-anxiety. Okay, (laughs) so they are going to address the fact that two-thirds of young people feel sad, afraid, and anxious about climate crisis. And then they'll go back, right, to discussing war. Now, the panels and the participants are undeniably Western and NATO-focused, as evidenced in this panel called Return of the West, which... I just couldn't even believe that this existed. Hey, are you going to the Return to the West conference this afternoon after lunch? It's about how the invasion of Ukraine triggered an unexpectedly united and forceful response from the United States and European Union and UK. Let's go talk and hang out there. Like, thank you for that chuckle, Philip. You want to tell me what you <laughs> yeah, think no, of I'm, just, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, because that's, that's, I mean, like, seriously, if, if, if like McDonald's comes out with a new sandwich that unifies the West, I mean, we're pretty unified, you know, it's like, it's not like it took a whole hell of a lot. Yeah. You know, right. So come on. I mean, this is like a, don't call it a t- comeback, right? The, right? the language is extremely telling. It uses words like, unexpectedly united and forceful response. Does anybody sit in these conferences with like a pad and paper and like a pen? Like, oh, I'm sorry, go. Oh, oh we thought oh, the West okay. was maybe so, not, so, right? Like, oh, oh we didn't like, know shushing, we were this the people, awesome. Shushing yeah. the people around him like, shh, I gotta hear what the CEO oh, of Raytheon yeah. has to say about the environment. Right. You yeah. know, like, come right. on. <laughs> How are Javelin missiles actually, they do kill people, but in fact, they open up bunkers for us to ad- allow for digging, digging water. There is actually a panel about protecting uh, the environment, how, how climate change could exacerbate the next pandemic and a panelist from Moderna is on it. And it's very... <laughs> I'll say no more. But this panel is especially this, like how the West is awesome. It's like, I just couldn't, I can't believe it exists. It's like, I'm too sexy for this panel. Now we've talked many times about how and when companies and governments speak in favor of popular social topics. It's usually to distract them from the rest of us from things that they are doing in pursuit of their own interests. As is the case of the U.S. and the U.K., we are the saviors of Ukraine, right, by lending them these weapons with interest and destroying the planet all the while, so pay your taxes. So while they all give themselves this stakeholder dialogue pass as if they are representing global interests, they're not. They can't, right? Ramaswamy says that stakeholder capitalism is capitalism gone wild because the people who are wielding power are already extreme winners of capitalism. So they use this stakeholder name as a smoke screen to continue doing business as usual. 
With this in mind, let's try and give the Davos participants some kind of benefit of the doubt. Let's say that many people did show up with the aim of changing the world for good, right? Maybe. So what has come out of Davos in the past? Are we closer to curbing carbon emissions, given that that's been a topic at Davos for decades? Right. I mean, if you think about like all the things that have been on this on their docket for however many years, right? What have we accomplished? Like, what have we actually seen come to fruition after you had the likes of Bill Gates is hobnobbing with Al Gore? Right. Like, you know, we talk about an inconvenient truth, right? Now, all of these things that these billionaires have the opportunity to do in these big governments, what have we actually accomplished then? Well, we're, in fact, closer to accelerating our carbon emissions globally. Um, are there peace talks that no. maybe would make progress for everybody and not just Western sympathizers? Well, I don't know about this. Go to the next screen that says Davos, Russia. Okay. And Zelensky was there. He gave a speech. Too. Yes. Okay. Um, so that doesn't seem like, you know, there's any, like, there's no, how do we get to peace? It's how do we win against this force, right? So now what will these then powerful people do to advance life for everyone else since they are using this term stakeholder, right? So then you have to think they represent us all. They will talk about pandemic preparedness. They'll talk about inclusion, ESGs, big topic there, women's health, building trust, although thankfully they don't use the term disinformation because you know how I feel about that word. Um, but look at this panel, youth mistrust, tackling youth mistrust. Well, maybe young people don't trust you because of you didn't do what Greta Thur Thunberg asked during her Davos speech in 2020. And, and for the record, when we children tell you to panic, we're not telling you to go on like before. We're not telling you to rely on technologies that don't even exist today at scale and that science says perhaps never will. We are not telling you to keep talking about reaching net zero emissions or carbon neutrality by cheating and fiddling around with numbers. We're not telling you to offset your emissions by just paying someone else to plant trees in places like Africa while at the same time, forests like the Amazon are being slaughtered at an infinitely higher rate. Planting trees is good, of course, but it's nowhere near enough of what is needed, and it cannot replace real mitigation and rewilding nature. And let's be clear, we don't need a low carbon economy. We don't need to lower emissions. Our emissions have to stop if we are to have a chance to stay below the 1.5 degree target. And until we have the technologies that at scale can put our emissions to minus, then we must forget about net zero. We need real zero. Okay, well, they didn't do any of that. Uh, net zero is still a big topic of conversation in the panels mm -hmm. and um, you know, they didn't do anything that she had asked for, like stop subsidies to fossil fuel, stop researching more fossil fuel expansion. In fact, uh, you know that the United States has opened up more drilling in the Gulf Coast. So uh, surprisingly, she's not speaking this year, even though they say they do want to build young people's trust and mitigate their eco anxiety. And look, anyone can take this event schedule and just poke a million holes in it. But when the conversations are so obvious and full of contradictions, I just can't find anything other than disingenuous and privileged people looking out for themselves under the guise of stakeholder capitalism. But the event just kicked off this week, so I will keep my ears open and maybe the elites will prove me wrong. <laughs> no, they won't. And I think as someone in our chat just said, George Furman just said, the devil is the corporate class as a class. We blame you. They fail us. And he says, well articulated and clear minded kid. You know, you can say what you want about Greta Thornburg and if she's being run by adults and are telling her what to say. But she made a clear statement there that like you guys get up here and you, all you guys do is fiddle with numbers and oh, I'm going to pay for a carbon offset credit 
So I can I can fly my jets as much as I want as long as I pay somebody for it. Yeah. Like I can offset it by I'm going to plant a few trees in Africa. Like that math, it doesn't work. Right. You know? That's like paying for your Catholic confection or, or confession or however. Exactly. That works. The, yeah. What is it? Plenary indulgences, plenary indulgences that the Catholic Church used to allow. Like, uh, OK, I'm a, I'm a wealthy person. So can I go and sin and then I'll just pay you at the Catholic Church and I'll be we'll be good to go. Is that how that works? Um, and that's the way that's the way the rich do it and they get away with it. And of course, well, I mean, the that's, people, how, that's how our legal system works. Sorry. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. But you know, what's funny is well, not funny, but you know, when Greta's standing up there and behind her is that picture of Africa, it was like just like, you know, barren wasteland. It's like who gets screwed in all of this? Right. Africa gets screwed. Like, see, like, look what's happening in Nigeria right now is yeah. shell shell oil just like runs the gamut. Uh, uh, you know, basically destroying that entire that entire region for the for oil. Um, right. And so, so many of these, these talks about like, how do we win against Russia? How do we keep Russia from having more power? How do we, you know, well, Western forces have not shown that they are any better for the environment or there's no, like, you have to just oppose these things. They don't exist in a vacuum, right? War absolutely destroys natural habitats. Right. And so you have to address how much of that is acceptable in the current thinking is that all war is acceptable because we just kind of have to, because we're in it, right? And I was reading a book this weekend that talked about how the United States during the Vietnam War used cloud seeding, which is when you send up a certain chemical that will make clouds precipitate um, in order to slow down supply trucks to the enemy and create just muddy roads, right? In North Vietnam. In Vietnam, yeah. during the Vietnam War. I mean, who the hell do you think you are playing God with nature in order to win a war, right? And so if we've proven that we will do that, I couldn't believe it, like this statistic. But you, I mean, these are the, this is the military industrial complex. They will do anything. They're right. going to seed clouds to stop the northern North Vietnamese. Like that's what they're going to do. They're also going to, they're all, there's a whole movie on like using the CIA for, you know, and like, uh, you know, using people that can do telepathy. So we have to just oppose these viewing. things and realize like we will all die from this existential crisis of destroying the earth. Right. And so then can we have a conversation about war as if it exists in Space Invaders? Because it doesn't. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's incredibly troubling. I see these guys, you know, the World Economic Forum right now is meeting in Switzerland and Geneva. So from May 22nd through like the 28th, Davos is meeting in Davos, Switzerland. So all these rich and wealthy are coming over and having these little sessions. And see, I think CNBC summed it up well when they had a reporter like doing his little stand up. And he said, we're here at Davos, the world's biggest networking event. Come on, let's go inside and take a look at it. I was like, event. I'm like, you just summed it up perfectly. Like, it's just like, who can we rub arms with and, you know, make, rub elbows with and make deals, yeah. make business deals. Let us know what you guys think about this. Um, in the chat below. What do you guys think about Davos and all of these billionaires there? Thank you so much for subscribing to our channel. You know, we've been banned, we've been blocked, we've been censored. That's why we started our own website to stay connected with you for free. That's right. So head on over to redacted.inc and make sure you're connected with us. You can sign up again at redacted.inc, not .com.